go ahead and just let, um, let, let people um, keep joining throughout the conversation, if that makes sense. Uh, so hello everyone, thank you so much for being here today. My name is Laura, I work at Open Book Publishers as a Marketing and Library Relations Officer. Uh, it's a pleasure to virtually meet you all. Uh, so uh, today we'll, we will be hosting a panel with uh, some of the contributors of introducing visual audiences. So this book um, presents a collection of essays that examines uh, the scope and consequences of digital vigilantism in different contexts. Um, so digital vigilantism as, con as a phenomenon that is emerging on a global scale and which sees um, digital audiences using social platforms to shape uh, social realities and political life in general. Uh, so this book uh, is an open access title that was uh, published a few months ago by Open Book Publishers and is available for everyone to read uh, on the link that I'm sending on uh, the chat at the moment. So just feel free to have a look through it either throughout the conversation or after um, and yet yeah, so it's available both in PDF and HTML in case you have any particular preference when accessing the format. So um, this panel will be divided in three different sections. So the first section will be uh, the contributors presenting their own thoughts or um, the, their own points about their chapters and their contributions. The second section will be a Q&A that I will host um, and that will be questions from open book publishers to the uh, different panelists. And the third part would uh, be questions from you, from the audience. So please feel free to uh, share any questions that you want on the chat feature as well uh, throughout the conversation. Uh, the only thing I would ask you for is like to put the name of the person that you want to direct the question to. So because we have uh, five panelists in here, so we don't want to mess, um, mess up the questions. Uh, so yeah, and finally, before going ahead, um, I would like to remind you that this is being recorded and this will be later uploaded on our YouTube channel for everyone to see for those who couldn't attend today. Uh, so please uh, make sure you have your microphones muted and make sure that um, throughout the diff like the conversation, uh, no sound is um, interfering with the presentations because that takes the image out and then the video won't have the uh, complete, um, yeah, recording of each panelist. Uh, so thank you so much again for that. Uh, so without further ado, we will start with uh, Yashu Ho. So uh, Yashu will be talking about her chapter, uh, which is called Contesting the Vulgar and My Performance of a, uh, sorry, from a Quiet Show. You can definitely correct me on that later. And <laughs> might not be, that might not be the right pronunciation, but yeah. Uh, and then it's called Online Village of Vigilantism toward Chinese underclass use on social media platforms. So, so before going ahead, I wanted to quickly tell you about Yashi a bit more. So Yashi is a PhD candidate at the Graduate School of Interdisciplinary Information Studies at the University of Tokyo. Uh, her research centers and investigating the intricate relationship between digital technology and its social context, especially on how various digital media platforms contribute to the social class stratification process particularly in Asian societies. So uh, she's also working on an independent documentary at the moment. Um, and this country has a focus on the living conditions of young Chinese migrant workers as well. So yeah, she will, you can go ahead if you want, the floor is completely yours. Thank you. Hello everyone, can, can you hear me and see the, my, my share of my screen? Okay, thank you very much for coming to this event. And I am Jiaxi Ho from, as Laura just said, from the University of Tokyo. I would love to share some vigilant practices I observe in the Chinese cyberspace. Um, in my study, which is the chapter three of the, the book, in, uh, Introducing Vigilant Audiences, I focus on a specific uh, vocal performance popular among the underclass Chinese youth. And the features of this performance triggered um, collective denunciations among the general public toward this uh, marginal social group. And this kind of performance is named as Hamai, uh, literally it means mm, shouting with a microphone. The screenshot I put on the left is, um, is what a typical Hamai video looks like. Uh, usually the performer sits in front of the webcam and holding a microphone and he or she will just read out some pre-written rhymed lyrics along with the rhythmic background music. And for um, for many unfamiliar viewers of Hanmai, they will find the genre sharing a lot in common with African-American hip hop rap at first glance. However, I have to note the differences between Hanmai and Chinese hip hop rapping um, because the latter is pretty um, consistent with the global hip hop culture. 
uh, though most of the rappers, they actually rap in the Chinese language, but many of them actually follow the global trend in music flows, in dressing styles, and many of them were are uh, highly visible in the mainstream entertainment industry. While for Hamai rappers, they usually look um, kind of unsophisticated and sometimes strange or or rustic. Um, and some of them um, only share their performance, and many of them only share their performance on the underclass-centric social media platforms, such as Kuaishou. Um, the most significant difference might be the audience. Like fans of Chinese hip hop rap are usually urban, middle class, educated young people, while Hamai lovers are composed of a variety of uh, marginal social groups, such as young rural migrant workers. And being a genre um, created by the underclass youth, many Hamai works. Uh, ex actually express the yearning uh, of the underclass for social mobility and their critiques about existing social inequalities. And um, many of these denunciations were far from actually being politically dissident because they usually target on some like fictional social elites or rhetoric authorities. For example, in MC Qixing's work, Buddha says, he cleverly appropriates the image of Monkey King to speak out the powerlessness of the underclass and intentionally neglecting the, the common perception of Monkey King as an adorable and a very, um, very capable national hero. Um, before, actually before 2017 or even 2018, Hamai Rat was basically some self-entertainment within underclass youth themselves. And when the genre got more and more like visible online, the, the vigilant audiences, may, mostly composed of middle-class internet users, were offended by the visibility and the vulgarity of the underclass in the virtual space. So they used a variety of practices such as shaming and humiliation and denunciations to disparage the Hamai creators and viewers. And by creating criticizing the Volga Hamai as an inferior, as a laughable and decultured other, the sense of a superior middle-classness uh, is reinforced among these internet users. And um, the middle-class user-generated denunciation targeting on Hamai also triggered the state intervention. In April 2018 in particular, the state temporarily cracked down Kuaishou, uh, this social media platform where Hamai community highly depended on. And after being penalized, Hamai gradually disappeared from a genre with tens of thousands of updates every day to almost nothing, like no one performing, no videos being shared, and no more public discussions about whether Hamai is boga or, or whether they deserve denunciation or not. So what I found most interesting when tracing the rise and fall of underclass Hamai rap is that first vigilant practices were conducted targeting a social group rather than an, a specific individual. And these practices were motivated by a variety of value judgments that were especially meaningful in constructing one's social class identities in contemporary China. And second, um, the state the platform and the users were positioned in a very asymmetric power structure where either middle class or underclass users could hardly uh, negotiate with the state or with the social media platforms. So this will be a very brief introduction about my chapter in the book. I guess I will leave time, leave more time for the other contributors and their fabulous studies. And I look forward to all kinds of comments and questions in the Q&A session. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Yashi, for that. So um, and now the next contributor that will be participating is Abdul Rahim uh, Shofawak, uh, on and his chapter is Empowerment, Social Distrust, uh, distrust and Co-Production of Security, a Case of Study of Digital Vigilantism in Morocco. So just to briefly introduce you to Abdul Rahim a bit um, before going ahead. So he's a media and communication te uh, researcher from Morocco. He holds a doctorate um, in advertising and communication and an MA in Moroccan American Studies uh, from Hassan University and from the University of Casablanca. And his research interests includes media discourse analysis, media policy, and digital culture in general. So 
uh, after Rahim without taking more time from your from your do you want to go ahead yeah sure thank you very much uh, Laura for the efforts you've invested in making this uh, event uh, come into fruition and of course I would like to, to welcome the uh, the audience my chapter uh, focuses on um, a case study of uh, digital digital vigilantism in uh, uh, in Morocco, and through the lens of that um, uh, that event, uh, we have the uh, the possibility to see uh, a number of uh, insights and to uh, draw them in order to, in order to understand the situation of vigilantism in the country as a whole. Uh, I would like to start by giving uh, a brief idea about the event itself, and then. Uh, I will highlight some, some of its uh, insights and some of its meanings that uh, can shed light on the situation in the country. The, uh, the event uh, that my uh, chapter focuses on is, uh, I mean, as a student assaults his teacher in, in the classroom. Uh, a weird event uh, at the end of the day in which, I mean, uh, a pupil punches his uh, teacher while in the classroom and the some of the other students managed to shoot the events the misconduct and the misbehavior and share that uh, online so the, this is the first instance of uh, of vigilantism that there is an offense uh, within uh, a classroom setting then one of the students managed to shoot the whole thing and shared the uh, the video online and once the uh, video reached uh, uh, the uh, uh, social media platforms, especially Facebook, which is ubiquitous in Morocco. Uh, yeah, the whole country, I mean, uh, went uh, on an uproar. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, uh, everybody started denouncing the whole uh, behavior or misbehavior rather. And then uh, the, the video went viral. It reached, uh, I mean, uh, a ne ne it went nationwide. It reached approximately all corners of the uh, country. Everybody uh, somehow at least watched or heard about the, uh, the event. Uh, even though it was, uh, I mean, uh, a Sunday, and the Moroccans were uh, on that day uh, busy, maybe watching some international football match or something of that sort. Nevertheless, I mean, uh, reactions, uh, I mean, uh, happened instantly from all uh, uh, stakeholders, all the key ones, including education authorities at the national, regional, and local level, uh, families, uh, social media activists, uh, I mean, uh, uh, in uh, unions, uh, teacher unions, uh, I mean, uh, all the uh, key stakeholders, politicians, MPs, ministers, even uh, key figures in uh, in the uh, secu in security departments reacted nationally, regionally, and locally. I mean, it was a real, uh, I mean, uh, event in the country. It, it that was not um, uh, expected to go unnoticed uh, because of that act of shooting and sharing uh, online. So that's the uh, the event. Now. That event and uh, all the circumstances that took place around it can give us, I mean, an idea about at least two key uh, things in the context. The context uh, in which that event happened uh, included two key uh, features. The first one uh, is the increasing uh, digitalization uh, in Morocco, in, uh, which can tell us that more and more people are buying uh, uh, smartphones and uh, connectivity is uh, is not bad. It's good, rather, since Morocco is uh, uh, posing itself as a technology hub in uh, the MENA region, or at least in North Africa, given its geopolitical uh, or uh, geographical location between Europe and uh, and Africa and the uh, the Arab world. So um, that's the first thing, which is the digitalization, which is uh, an ongoing process. Uh, increasingly in, in the country. And together with uh, digitalization comes what uh, Andreas Hepp describes as deep mediatization. So it's not just digitalization that is, I mean, uh, material, but it is also social, which is mediatization. More and more people are being accustomed uh, to the use of, uh, uh, of social media, of uh, different platforms, different devices. Uh, I mean, wearable and other and uh, otherwise socially embedded uh, 
uh, devices, phones, uh, in particular in this case, uh, despite the fact that uh, social media and vigilantism uh, uh, as an effect help reduce the different aspects of exclusion that the digital age brings with it. With it. The digital age brings with it in Morocco, uh, uh, I'm talking now, a, a, a number of aspects of uh, exclusion. That is to say, a number of social groups are excluded in the digital age. Here I'm talking about the poor, the elderly, kids, um, people in the countryside, uh, etc. They are excluded, in fact. Uh, the illiterate, they are excluded. But vigilantism helps, helps counter that by uh, pushing people to be more and more included in uh, uh, public uh, debates. You see, this is, this is the first aspect. The second one is uh, in the context. The second one is the context of the Arab Spring. Since uh, Morocco belongs to the uh, Arab world and uh, in uh, 2000 and towards the end of uh, 2010 and throughout 2011 up till today, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, developments of the Arab Spring have never ceased to exist. We frequently, up till today, I'm saying, we still see, uh, I mean, uh, street uh, uh, protests. We can see people uh, demanding different social, political, economic uh, changes. Uh, and that context, I mean, uh, uh, also helped in uh, bringing uh, vigilantism into uh, more... Uh, uh, vigor to become more vigorous and more uh, visible, uh, helping people see the benefits of the digital age, uh, despite the different aspects of uh, exclusion that I uh, mentioned. Then uh, this is the uh, the context. I would like just to conclude with some two or three uh, uh, points uh, that uh, uh, I mean uh, show how Moroccans are have been continuously using and uh, valuing the impact of uh, vigilantism on their uh, lives, on their aspirations, on their relationship with the state. Uh, since uh, at the end of the day, I can say that that event can tell us that vigilantism can function for the three uh, uh, words that uh, I have in the title, which is whether it is empowerment or uh, trust, social uh, distrust or a co-production of uh, security. In fact, vigilantism helps in the three regards to, uh, to uh, I mean, infuse more empowerment, uh, bottom-up uh, empowerment, uh, or what um, uh, Jorgen Habermas describes of, uh, as uh, a peripheral overflow. So uh, through vigilantism, we have seen considerable uh, the, um, peripheral, peripheral overflow since the city in which that event happened is what is that which is far away from the center. It is a periphery, nevertheless, it, uh, uh, through vigilantism, that city managed somehow to uh, uh, to push a number of uh, policies uh, uh, related to education and security in, in schools forward. So it is uh, bottom up. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, impact is bottom up empowerment. It's also an aspect of social distrust, since I mean, uh, uh, through the different cases of vigilantism, and then I I, I will. Uh, Come back to some others uh, in uh, in the discussion uh, today. I mean, um, citizens frequently show that there is some sort of distrust. Since I mean, uh, through their vigilantism, through the different cases they highlight, they uh, want to say that I mean, uh, possibly they need more uh, security around. They uh, want to contribute. They want to participate. They have the capacity, despite the different aspects of exclusion. Nevertheless. Uh, uh, the, po the politicians, the elite in, in the center, in Rabat, in uh, Casablanca, need to, uh, to trust the citizens more and uh, need to uh, seek more trust from the citizens. And so vigilantism is, uh, I mean, uh, one zone which, in which we can uh, uh, discuss the uh, uh, issue of uh, social distrust. And also it's uh, an aspect of uh, co-production. Since uh, through vigilantism, through shooting uh, events uh, uh, that are that bring some offense, uh, and uh, sharing them online and talking about them, discussing them, uh, sharing them uh, virally through WhatsApp, through uh, mainly uh, Facebook and YouTube, uh, which are very famous. The, the three platforms are very famous in the country, added to Instagram. 
So uh, the uh, citizens want to say that we want to co-produce our own uh, security. We have the possibility to do that. But on the other hand, I don't think that the uh, security agencies are ready enough to uh, to believe in that possibility and to uh, give uh, citizens that the um, uh, or the possibility to contribute to their own uh, uh, security. Since this is, I, I would say, uh, I mean, a governance mechanism through which, I mean, the elites want to continue governing through, uh, I mean, holding all security possibilities in their own uh, hands. So this is a general idea about what the chapter is about, some of its insights, and I will be very happy to, uh, I mean, to discuss more or to give more ideas about uh, the event, about the its meanings and its implications for Morocco today. And thank you very much for listening. Thanks to you. Thank you so much. Uh, so the next person we have with us today is Sarah Milburn. Um, so Sarah Milburn wrote, wrote, wrote a chapter and it's called Make Them Famous, Digital Vigilantism and Virtuous Denunciation After Charlottesville. Uh, so she will be presenting about this uh, in a couple of minutes. I will just quickly introduce her. So Tara is an Associate Professor at Self Sociology uh, in the Augustana Faculty at the University of Alberta in Canada. She works in the area of social theory, visual sociology, urban culture and digital media. Her current research uh, explores new and contested ways that photographic images are by, of identifiable strangers are generated and distributed across contemporary public spheres, uh, with this raising critical questions about what it means to be a social person to, to have it and create a world together. Uh, so Tara, if you're around there, yeah, I got a few are. Um, the floor is yours. So. Okay, thank you. I'm going to just share screen. Can you see the uh, the image? We can, yep. Yeah. Okay, great. great. Um, good. This is the only visual that I will use, and it's a pretty um, prolifically circulated um, image compilation that I'm sure many people have uh, have already seen. Okay, so I want to begin by thanking um, everybody at Open Book Publishers and Laura for organizing this event, committing to this book and making it widely accessible to readers around the world. It's, it's so wonderful that it's uh, open access. And I also wanna give a shout out to the editors of the volume, fellow contributors and members of the audience um, today uh, and, and beyond. Uh, so in my brief presentation, I'm going to say a little bit about my chapter, talk about the questions that I had and what I think was significant about the case of digital vigilantism that I analyzed. So my chapter is called Make Them Famous, Digital Vigilantism and Virtuous Denunciation After Charlottesville. It is an interpretive visual sociological case study of a very high profile social media campaign that was aimed at de-anonymizing or outing participants who were filmed and photographed during the widely publicized and violent white supremacist rallies that took shape in the streets of Charlottesville, USA in August, 2017. So these uh, rallies brought hundreds of participants together under the banner of Unite the Right um, and were widely reported upon around the world. And they also drew together hundreds of counter protesters animated by social justice concerns. So in my title, the phrase make them famous is borrowed from and makes reference to a grassroots social media call to action that you can see on the screen that was put forth by a young media activist using his existing Twitter account, Yes, You're Racist. Uh, if you recognize any of the Nazis marching, send me their names and profiles and I'll make them famous was how this call was articulated. So there were others, but this was the most high profile and well-coordinated site that was used to identify and later expose otherwise anonymous rally participants as such to audiences beyond those who were assembled uh, in person on those days. So correct identification opened rally participants up to various possible adverse consequences in their home communities and social networks. These effects included reputational damage, job loss, severing of relationships and other manifestations of disaffiliation as I detail through a small selection of individual cases in my chapter. So part of what was sociologically interesting for me about this case was the general ambivalence and moral uneasiness that exists today around digital media shaming and doxing. 
um, coupled with the suggestion that was made by one of the media commentators in this case that perhaps a quote, shame pass was in order here, given the exceptional nature of the events that inspired the social media call to identify participants. So additionally, in the prolific public discourse that these events generated, commentators often questioned whether or not it was reasonable for any participant in such a public event to expect to remain anonymous afterwards anyway. So could um, outing rally goers even be considered a, a violation? So these questions were part of um, the, the, the digital vigilantism campaign. People were thinking about what it meant to be doing it while, while doing it as is evidenced in, in many of the comments. So part of the work that I did in the chapter was try to uncover the unspoken or tacit assumptions which the highly dispersed social media activists and allies shared in their coordinated work of making rally goers famous through circulating images and words in the digital public sphere. So to understand how participation in this social media campaign was framed as, quote, necessary and virtuous under the circumstances, I looked at the social media call to action in detail how it was and how it was taken up in some of the most circulated postings that it, that it generated. Uh, I also argued that to understand the social media campaign, um, it is critical to understand the sense of danger and exceptionality that was associated with the Unite the Right rallies in Charlottesville. So a much noted fact was that for the most part, rally goers were not hiding their faces while they marched in the public streets, uh, carrying torches, holding signs, and chanting slogans associated with Nazism and anti-Black racism. Rather, they were presenting themselves um, publicly into the world as a growing and legitimate presence. And now infamously, the former US President Trump did not initially denounce white supremacists by name, but rather referred to, quote, violence on many sides, as well as very, quote, fine people on both sides. So these were important factors um, for understanding how and why the social media campaign <clears throat> was taken up uh, by many dispersed participants and also commentators as something acceptable and even virtuous under the circumstances in spite of um, moral reservations around de-anonymizing tactics. So a question that I ask in, my, in the chapter is what would have been different about Charlottesville 2017 without the social media campaign that worked to de-anonymize participants after the dust had settled? In other words, what did this campaign produce or achieve and what are some of its significant social implications? So first, uh, I argued that the campaign helped to solidify a dominant meaning of what kind of event the Unite the Rally was within the broader public culture. So an ominously exceptional, socially dangerous and potentially historically significant mo moment, even turning point within contemporary US society. It contributed to a united refusal within much of civil society to normalize and legitimate the proud expression of violent white nationalism and violent white supremacy, the kind of legitimation that rally organizers, vocal participants and event supporters who assembled under the Unite the Right banner were seeking and possibly anticipating. So it helped to reject the trappings of moral equivalency as if what was being enacted in Charlottesville in the streets was merely one political orientation among many. So the Trump response could only have intensified the felt necessity of such a refusal um, for the moral majority of concerned and outraged spectators to the events that, was, that were occurring in the streets of Charlottesville on those days. Um, the refusal to legitimate the terrain of violent white nationalism and supremacy was largely achieved, I argue, by making positive participation in such manifestations, particular, personal, and thereby socially risky for the previously unknown and anonymous participant. So I argue that this was the unique aspect that the digital vigilantism campaign added to Charlottesville 2017. And as I stress in my chapter, uh, its power lay primarily in the socio-moral domain, not the formal legal domain. So whereas the vigorous public opposition, including counter rallies, was largely articulated in relation to social justice principles, the targeting of individuals and the naming of participant names 
that was encouraged and coordinated through social media tools and platforms created conditions for a type of accountability and consequence for the otherwise um, anonymous and unremarkable rally participant. So the campaign of digital vigilantism took things beyond the level of a general condemnation um, of a series of events by making anyone's positive association with and during the events live on in ways that were potentially con um, consequential for those individuals. So I suggest that the prolific circulation of specific instances of correct identification and exposure constituted a public lesson of sorts in communicating to anybody who participates in such an event now or into the future to expect significant visibility. Such a lesson would be most likely to be effective for the participant for whom attendance um, was likened to a kind of casual thrill seeking or weekend adventure less so for the committed true believer. So as I stress throughout my chapter, the most powerful but also invisible force that enabled this digital vigilante campaign to have the effects that it did was the unspoken moral force of a shared vision of a world in which racially motivated hatred and violence must be made to have no legitimate place. That is why um, disaffiliation um, was the consequence for, for many people once they had been correctly identified um, as willing and enthusiastic participant. So uh, in my conclusion to the chapter, I state that, well, of course, campaigns of digital vigilantism can be inspired and undertaken um, for a variety of political, cultural, or personal interests. The case that I focus on in this book offers some insight into how such methods can be mobilized on behalf of social justice interests. Thanks. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so next person we have is uh, Rand Decker. So she wrote on um, citizens and states, or uh, sorry, um, police responses to digital vigilantism. So just to introduce her a bit more before we go ahead. Uh, so she's an assistant professor at the, at the Utrecht University School of Governance. She also studies social media as a modern source of social pressure within governance in two societal domains. So first public security and second migration and integration. And finally, she uses co-design methods, including the Living Lab, method, uh, Living Lab methodology as an engaged research practice. Uh, so, Grant, I live, yeah, I live to see you. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, uh, Laura. And uh, I'd like to join the uh, the previous speakers in expressing my thanks for organizing this very nice event and also for uh, having been able to contribute a chapter to this uh, to this very nice volume. Um, I've uh, co-authored a chapter together with my colleague Albert Meyer, also from the Utrecht uh, School of Governance, on police responses to digital vigilantism. We are both in the Department of Public Governance, so that uh, is what, uh, what interested us. Um, let me skip to the next. So uh, many acts of digital vigilantism relate to police and law enforcement uh, efforts. So we've seen some examples in the previous presentations, but you might also think of web sleuths, uh, pedophile hunters, hacktivists, and online neighborhood watch groups. Um, uh, they engage in different ways with police and law enforcement practices. And what's interesting is that the different labels that are used by law enforcement and, uh, and government to, uh, to denote these practices uh, highlight differences in perception, whether these are helpful or harmful acts. So sometimes they are referred to as vigilante acts, but also sometimes they, they are considered to be do-it-yourself policing or co-production of public security. So we wondered uh, where does law enforcement draw these discursive boundaries in what acts are harmful or helpful? And we've explored this in a series of workshops with European law enforcement agencies. Um, uh, in total, uh, around 200 uh, participants uh, uh, participated from police, from government agencies, and also NGOs. And in a series of dialogues, they, uh, they discuss different examples of digital vigilantism. So what were, uh, did we find? 
So first, the accepted forms of, uh, of online co-production or, or vigilantism, but then in the positive uh, uh, frame, of course, um, is that it's uh, engagement with crime prevention. So the early stages of these um, acts. So denouncement of crimes, but also sharing crime prevention warnings. These are uh, um, uh, no doubt accepted uh, um, uh, practices and acts. And also engagement with the next stages of crime fighting, but only when collaboration with police is sought already in the earlier stages, and also when it concerns local issues. So issues happening in someone's direct vicinity and in someone's community itself not issues taking place in other countries and uh, in uh, other places, then they start wondering, well, why would these people be motivated to uh, help uh, in crime fighting in these uh, cases? So the lights here are going out <laughs> because I was uh, sitting too long. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm back. Uh, and then on to the uh, disputed forms of uh, online co-production, or uh, then in that case, digital vigilantism. And that are the acts that move beyond uh, people's uh, direct uh, uh, environment and also beyond collaboration with police from the early stages. So the, the accepted forms closely reflect a traditional strategy of community policing that's also been happening offline. So beyond these practices, there are concerns for, on the one hand, harm to citizens and society um, in case of premature accusations of suspects as offenders, um, a focus on only effectiveness and not on process values in these uh, acts of crime fighting, and also unprofessional standards of investigation of, and punishments. So, for example, when citizens act as judge, jury, and executioner in these uh, cases. Uh, law enforcement also fears harm to police work. So, even in the uh, accepted forms of uh, 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 do-it-yourself policing, they fear that it might overburden police with information about new cases. It might jeopardize ongoing investigations by disclosing information. Uh, but also prosecution if there's already been a lot of attention for a certain case. And lastly, it might also, there's also concern that it might undermine police authority when um, uh, citizens take matters in their own hands. So to conclude, uh, what we found really interesting is that, that the accepted forms closely mirror this uh, practice of community policing. But what does that mean? when? The notions of locality are shifting by these digital means, but also what does collaboration exactly mean? Uh, not only bringing cases to the police, but can the police also really collaborate with these citizens? Um, we've also seen throughout Europe different efforts to create more guidance for uh, do-it-yourself policing groups and individuals. So, for example, in the Netherlands, there have been efforts to create apps that help people out to um uh, uh to in crime fighting related to very simple cases close to home um but also by regulating it by providing training etc and lastly uh, an interesting uh, question is if and uh, how the police can harness the power of citizen self-organization against crime can this be done uh, without uh, uh having the harmful effects of uh, digital vigilantism. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so our um, next and final presenter of the evening is Sari Yan. So she wrote a chapter on More Ice and Crime, the rhetoric of mediated matches. Uh, she will soon yet go and be with you again as well presenting this, but I will quickly introduce her. So Sarah is a Maurice Kodowska career leading fellow postdoc at Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Uh, she researches surveillance, technical communication, information and rhetoric, especially in the law enforcement and investigation context. Uh, she previously worked as a lecturer at the School of Information at the University of Arizona and has spent over 11 years contracted as an investigator for the US government. 
Sarah will also be starting quite a new project dealing with surveillance and the security of content networks. So um, Sarah, I think you're also right there. Sorry, I have like small images of all of you. So I just want to make sure. So yeah, if you are there, it's all yours. Thank you. Yeah, I can see you now. Good. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here with everyone. Um, kind of like everyone has said, I, I do, um, I'm excited to, to be able to talk about this chapter. Um, so I'll just kind of give you a brief overview of what the chapter um, was or in the conclusions I kind of came to and what led me to those conclusions tonight. So um, the idea is yes, more eyes on crime, the rhetoric of mediated mugshots. Um, and it's based on uh, the uh, Maricopa County Sheriff's Office uh, a uh, former site of uh, the, the mugshot of the day. Um, and here's kind of like a sketch. I didn't want to um, be too open about what it actually looked like and, and further um, address the, the, the individuals that were in, in the photos. But um, you can see that uh, at the top, they, they have a picture of the sheriff. Um, and then in the middle kind of area, there's uh, the, the winner, so to speak, of the mugshot of the day. Um, and then you can kind of search uh, through different crimes. Um, and then there's the, the other like runners up of the day. Um, so basically this idea is that the sheriff's office posts uh, mugshots of anyone that's got, uh, has been arrested um, and leaves them up on the site for three days. This ran from 2011 to 2015. So um, the, the or 16, I think. Uh, the current site still has the mugshots, but it's not a game, so to speak, where you can vote on, on individuals that have been arrested. So um, that's the, uh, the site. Um, and basically the, the Sheriff Joe is the, the individual that kind of made this uh, program. He wanted to tout himself as kind of the uh, America's toughest sheriff. Um, and he ha also had a, a lot of other pro programs in the mid uh, 2010s where he uh, made people that were arrested uh, live in tents in, in the desert. Uh, it's in Phoenix, Arizona, which is a, a desert city. Um, had these chain gangs. He boasted of like a 10 cent bologna sandwich uh, to, to feed the, the, um, the, the people that were in jail, made them wear pink underwear. Um, as if that was something bad, uh, had these jail cams where they would uh, kind of do a cam of people getting arrested or booked in, into the, the, the jail. So, um, so it was part, it's part of this larger phenomenon of posting social or uh, mugshots onto social media pages, but Sheriff Joe kind of um, uh, used it as something that to show how tough he was. Um, and he justified the posting and then the contest to, to see um, uh, whose mugshot would, I guess, rise to the top under the guise of, you know, more eye, eyes on arrestees may result in more leads to, to criminal investigators. So, um, but, you know, I wondered, is this really what's going on here? You know, what is the rhetoric of this uh, <laughs> the site? What are we, are we encouraged to do to, to identify more criminals? Um, and to do that, it was kind of hard because I, it's an anonymous site where you can't tell, you know, go back and ask who, why did you vote and, and why, or what, why are you interacting with the site? Um, so I tried to do kind of an object and views analysis of the website where I looked at the function, like what is the site allowing you to do and, and kind of what is it, what actions is it encouraging? Um, I, you would think that if it was encouraging uh, more eyes on crime, it might expect the site would help evaluate crime in some way or like facilitate some um, reporting procedure. Um, and then I look also looked at an assessment of the photo sample. So not only kind of like what was the site encouraging to do, but who are the people that were being um, picked? You know, you might expect those featured might represent a larger threat to society or something like that if you were trying to look at more um, uh, leads for criminal investigators. Um, so my overall argument that was, uh, you know, supporters claim that uh, mugshots online is uh, helps show tr more transparency of the, the agency and provides more information for community. Um, but is, is that the rhetoric that's being extolled through these sites? And then my argument is by looking at the, the program, I argue that um, through this exigies, exigency of entertainment on these uh, through participation, mugshots kind of called into being a group of digital entities and, and weapon that were weaponizing visibility. So um, the, the way that I came to that again is I did the summary of the site and then I looked at the people that were um, being chosen. Um, so the, the, the site, there was ways that you could, you know, kind of look at different crimes, but essentially um, you couldn't interact really with those. It's not like you could report somebody or see that. So, so 
in general, um, it wasn't designed to facilitate crime. It's kind of, it was made for kind of like an entertainment voting kind of system. And then the interesting thing that were the categories, the people that were being voted on um, weren't necessarily the more visible criminals or uh, like uh, the, 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 people, the people that were being arrested and, and voted for with the kind of had lower level issues like failure to pay fines or fees or um, kind of more what you might consider petty things. Um, but if you did look at the general trend at the way the people looked, um, if uh, looking at a sample of 285 mugshots, um, 182 to 184, depending on what coder looked at it, um, saw that they were at what could be considered an attractive female or a, a, then second runner up um, was way farther down. Um, but the kind of an alphabetical order, the, the main people that came up were disheveled females or disheveled males, somebody with a, a face, uh, maybe a strange facial expression or somebody with a crazy hairstyle, someone with an injury, um, someone with a funny name or some type of other visual that was striking um, or had a, a, a pose that might be considered humorous. Um, or like these large face tattoos or some tattoo all over their body. There was a category of unknowns, um, but uh, basically for the most part, the, the, the most um, popular, I guess, or most visible person was the attractive female. So, um, so the conclusion was it's, you know, the site doesn't necessarily lead the audience to a careful analysis of the crime where possible subjects can be identified and then the mo mo most attractive arrestees were the ones that ended up being most visible. So my conclusion is um, with that online, online mugshots can be a form of digital vigilantism because these interactive platforms, you know, yeah, kind of call into being, they, they ask people to in, interact and uh, get people to target particular people for these weaponized, either being intense, unwanted and enduring visibility you know, a, a characteristic of digital vi vigilantism that Trottier talks about in uh, his article in 2017. So, um, so if we're gonna consider that to be a digital, digital vigilantism, that this group of people can target individuals um, and kind of elevate their visibility to do harm to them, it does tend to have some implications. And one is that, you know, a mugshot viewer is typically viewed as somebody who um, kind of is a passive viewer that kind of watches at a distance. But being this, becoming a digital vigilante involves, you know, like actively participating or being involved. And as a viewer, um, you're not really, you know, elevating the status of someone, you're just kind of passively viewing it, but as a digital vigilante, you are able to weaponize vis visibility. The more likes that someone got, the more visible their, their photo became. It also raises questions of, um, you know, the motivations though of those that are being digital vigilantes, are they, uh, they're not necessarily justice seeking. In this case, um, there's more of an entertainment as exigency. People wanted to um, involve themselves maybe for fun. Um, I don't know, <laughs> I, again, I wasn't able to, but you know, there's a, a, a game version, a game um, basis for this exigency. And it also questions motive too, because um, to be a digital vigilante, do you have to, to come um, thinking that you're going to be shaming someone or, or is this kind of like a creep of the, the technology that you're using um, is, you know, it starts in the name of justice and more eyes on crime, but it ends up as an entertainment that um, disproportionately shames and, and uh, targets certain groups. Um, it also brings a public private connection, um, you know, a, a vigilante isn't necessarily um, is also oftentimes just someone that exercise or does their work outside of law enforcement so and then there's also a private public connection so um, but those are the connections I came to I, I thought this was overall an interesting case um, of uh, what could be considered digital vigilantism that uh, doesn't necessarily um, be motivated by the same uh, I guess exigency that other uh, spaces have been um, so anyway thank you for listening <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, so uh, now I will proceed with some Q and A so that I will share it with the different um, panelists. Um, in the meantime, if any of people, like anyone in the audience, have any questions, you feel free to put it on the chat feature. So first, I will go back to Yashi. So Yashi, I wanted to ask you, like, what are the current updates of the other class ham might rep culture, and um, is it really cracked down by the state of censorship or the public denunciation that you mentioned? 
Yeah, I, I would like to say that it might be oversimplified if we just interpret the fade out of Hamai as totally as a as a totally outcome of the state censorship um, uh, as they to try to em eliminate uh, the underclass voice from the online uh, the, the the Chinese online sphere. And actually, Hamai is never the main target of the state surveillance. And it disappeared with many other controversial or offensive content or the content that is tagged by vulgarity. And I, I would say that on the one hand, uh, because of the state, uh, the requirements from the state, uh, all the social media platforms in China, they need to conduct more like careful content, uh, content moderation, just like the global social media platforms. Do. And but on the other hand, the criteria for what is being harmful or what is being vulgar are never actually articulated in the Chinese public space. And more importantly, I want I want to say that the underclass centric social media platforms, such as Kuaishou, in this specific case, actually largely transformed this architectural structure ever since 2018. And now it changed from a social media platform facilitating mainly the spread of uh, short uh, short videos to a live streaming and e-commerce platform. And underclass users are more expected to be a self-employed live streamer and entrepreneur to use this technological tool to, to market various products and, and, and so, so as to overcome poverty. And so rather than saying Hamai was forcefully muted, uh, I would say that it might be better to say the attention and usage of underclass users are, are, are redirected and disciplined from self-expression through Hamai Rep. Um, yeah, so even though one, uh, maybe we can still find some re-emergence of Hamai works, um, they, I, I want to say that they are no longer significant in the Chinese public space as a, as a, as a very important expression of the underclass uh, Chinese younger people. Thank you so much for that. So I will continue going on the same order that we did the presentation. So I'm going next with Abdurrah Hem. So I wanted to ask you like, what is the added value of the chapter of your particular chapter in your research in the book as a whole and how has digital vigilantism uh, developed in Morocco since uh, you started research and then published the chapter? Okay, these are two different questions. I would like to address the first one first. Um, when it comes to the added value of the chapter, at least I can mention some three points. The first is that um, uh, the uh, geographical location that the uh, chapter belongs to, which is the Global South, uh, somehow, as it is put uh, uh, bluntly and uh, clearly in the introduction of the, uh, uh, of the book, uh, the, the, uh, usually when we speak about digital vigilantism, we would uh, focus mainly on the uh, Euro-American sphere, if I uh, can describe it as such, or the, on the global north, while the global south needs more light, I would say. And so the chapter belongs to that effort of shedding light of uh, other zones, uh, uh, I mean, where we can also speak about this uh, global trend of uh, holding uh, uh, digital devices and using them for the promotion of individual or community uh, demands, maybe locally, uh, regionally, or uh, nationally. So this is the first point, which is, uh, I mean, uh, an aspect of the global south. The second thing is that within that uh, large area that we describe as the global south, uh, the, the chapter also speaks about something very specific regionally, uh, region-wise, which is the Arab Spring. No other chapter mentions that, and uh, I think this is uh, part of the added value of the uh, chapter, but it's not the only work that speaks about the, uh, Arab, uh, the Arab Spring, I mean, uh, in academia. Academically speaking, this is not the only chapter that speaks about that. However, again, the added value of my chapter is that it speaks about the Arab Spring context, but not during the protests of the Arab Spring per se, but rather after that, and how that context of the Arab Spring has pushed or has encouraged uh, uh, common citizens to make use of the different devices in their hands. The third point is that um, uh, the focus on, uh, on Morocco as a country is, um, has its own uh, addition to the, to the book in the sense that in Morocco, we are here comparing traditional media and 
social or a new media. In traditional media, we have very little uh, freedom. And so, as um, I'm again quoting uh, Naomi Sakar, 2007, uh, in which uh, Naomi says that uh, 2007 now, of course, that thing has been proved more in, uh, in research, that the use of social media is a means for resisting the docilin impact of a traditional media. These are big uh, claims, and I, I agree with that, that through social media and through the, the example or the sample uh, or the case that the book focuses on, we can see that, yes, uh, social media can help, can promote, can uh, empower citizens to resist the docile impact of traditional media. So I, this is the uh, added value of the book to the, uh, of the chapter to the book. Uh, the second point, which is <coughs> how has vigilantism uh, developed uh, since the, uh, the writing of the book, which is uh, something like two or three years uh, uh, from now, especially that the book, uh, or at least the chapter, was wholly conceptualized before the pandemic. And so that's a key development that needs to be taken into account if, uh, I mean, uh, we would like to speak about, about vigilantism in Morocco, in some future uh, uh, chapter, I mean, if I am <laughs> going to write another uh, another chapter, I will certainly take into account the impact of the uh, pandemic, in which we have seen a lot of uh, other case studies, maybe similar, maybe more uh, challenging and more powerful uh, in that regard. So uh, during the uh, the pandemic, uh, I mean, uh, um, Moroccans were asked to, yeah, and that was a campaign, stay at home. That is to say, to avoid going into the street in, in order not to be contaminated or to further uh, spread the virus or contaminate uh, others. So a lot of uh, videos were, were shot and shared uh, online. And, and on the other hand, also there was a, a considerable case of uh, vigilantism that I, I may, I would like to discuss some uh, someday, uh, which is um, a policeman slaps a citizen in the streets. And some other citizens were passers-by who managed to shoot that and shared the uh, video online of that uh, policeman asking some uh, common citizen about some document of why you are living home, etc. It's all related to the uh, pandemic and to the stay-at-home uh, campaign. Nevertheless, it uh, backlashed against that policeman and a lot of denunciation and shaming uh, took place uh, online. Uh, this is the uh, one of the key developments. The second one is uh, during the, the friction between Morocco, the Polisario, and uh, Algeria uh, recently, uh, there was um, a lot of, again, uh, fake news separating from different sides. And so uh, online, we, uh, I mean, uh, we saw a lot of uh, um, correction of uh, uh, fake news, but also a lot of doxing, uh, not only for, this, for, for justice, it's not just justice-seeking efforts, but also entertainment. There, was, there were so many means, and uh, especially against uh, fake news. Uh, and uh, a little event happened in, in Paris in which uh, there was a demonstration from Morocco and somebody attacked that uh, demonstration. And uh, the Moroccan uh, activists managed to dox that person and share information uh, about him. And uh, I mean, asked for the, uh, the French, uh, I mean, uh, justice system to, uh, I mean, to bring that person into uh, to justice. And a third, maybe last one is, uh, recently, I mean, especially again during the pandemic, but this time uh, I would also like to shed light on some pro-state biased vigilantism. Because during the, uh, the pandemic, especially on, um, uh, on traditional media, but also on so-called private media here mainly, uh, private uh, radio channels. Uh, the, the combination of the two, I mean, traditional media, TV and radio, as uh, state media, and also so-called, so-described private media, uh, especially uh, radio channels, they started, uh, uh, I mean, uh, a public relations image repair campaign, pro-state, and they used a lot of vigilantism, doxing different activists, I mean, uh, um, sharing information about them, denouncing, or den uh, denouncing uh, people who would, I mean, not respect the uh, state, uh, uh, I mean, symbols or uh, the state leaders. It, there was a lot of vigil vigilantism, a lot, 
but this time prostate. And uh, that's, uh, again, uh, to some extent, I mean, an unwanted or undesired development that is not necessarily a pro uh, public, uh, uh, I mean, uh, service or uh, the uh, public interest. Uh, uh, because in the book we discuss uh, vigilantism that is mainly pro, uh, I mean, uh, public uh, interest or that would empower citizens uh, in their production of security. But here we are uh, also witnessing the opposite. So these are some of the developments that, of course, need uh, more uh, research if we would like, uh, again, to bring them into something uh, to be read. Well, hopefully we will have new information for you soon. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, my next question is for Tara. So uh, I wanted to ask you, Tara, like, uh, could you comment um, on what you see as broad social significance of the digital media campaign that you analyze? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Um, one of the things that I really liked about working on this bo book project is that we were asked to think about audiences. So the book is called, of course, Introducing Vigilant Audiences. And so one of the things that my case, and I think all of the um, presentations that we've heard today speak to is how um, the audience is changing for our, our acts, for better or for worse. So what it means to act before others, um, particularly in the public realm, uh, is really changing and um, audiences are expanding um, in ways that are sometimes unpredictable, but I think that this is more and more something that that um, people can and, and, and should expect, particularly during public events that are considered socially significant and controversial, um, and especially a formal institutional responses or solutions are considered uh, inadequate or non-existent. So another thing that, that I found really interesting in this case that I think has broader significance is that um, the power of de-anonymizing visibility doesn't lie in like pictures or names, but it, 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 it lies in a kind of shared vision of a world that people kind of feel and sort of spontaneously respond to such that um, somebody being identified as a participant in something that's largely condemned can have the kinds of social consequences that it does. So um, that's important to, to be mindful of. Another thing that um, we all had to think about in, in our, our papers for this book is, the, is, is how we are also implicated um, as, as authors, as researchers, and also just as, as citizens and co-producers of this um, fluid world that we live in. And so we all in our various ways and through our various positions have to grapple with these kinds of phenomena um, surrounding digital vigilantism uh, in all of their moral mixedness. So it's something that we, we all have to think about. Um, and in thinking about it, we, we have to think about the kind of world that we are co-creating co as we um, take action, respond, commentate, post, tweet, um, research, write about, uh, and so on, right? This isn't something that is like some thing out there that we're looking at through a microscope or we're, we're, we're in it as well. Uh, and it's very much part of, part of the contemporary world. Um, and so that's something that we, we all talked about um, in, the, in, the, in the final decisions around our chapters. And, and, um, and it's something that we all around the world uh, are grappling with. Thank you so much. Uh, so next I have Brian. Uh, so Brian, I wanted to ask you like what examples of digital vigilantism do police consider harmful or and helpful? Uh, and also like how can police and citizens develop a co-production of public security? Yeah, so uh, I think the, the one example that really um, uh, is most uh, contested is that of pedophile hunters, online pedophile hunter groups, also because the question there is, is it um, uh, is it about um, uh, um, online shaming of existing crimes or also in inciting or provoking crimes uh, amongst these groups? So is it creating new uh, acts that are uh, uh, happening? Um, and of course, it's very easy for the police, and we've seen that happening in the Netherlands over the 
uh, past months to say, well, don't do it, just stop. But I don't think that's a, a helpful way of, uh, of dealing with digital vigilantism. It's there and it's, uh, and I, uh, well, we've seen also during the COVID-19 pandemic, there's been online shaming of people uh, not staying at home and uh, 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 not uh, living by the, the new uh, uh, measures to tackle this pandemic. So I think instead of just saying, no, don't do it, police should come up with new ways of engaging with these groups. And for example, in the case of pedophile hunter groups, it's, uh, uh, there's, uh, it's uh, difficult to, uh, uh, to deal with people exposing others, but police have a lot of uh, need to, um, to tackle the online world, for example, of networks on the deep web uh, exchanging uh, uh, photographs and materials. So any um, help with, uh, uh, with leads on these networks would be, uh, 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 would be worth a lot more than these individuals and these very borderline cases that are provoked rather than exposed by these uh, uh, vigilante groups. So I think that would be a way forward to, uh, for the police, not just saying, no, don't do it, but to direct groups of digital vigilantes to acts that really could, uh, uh, could support law enforcement efforts. Thank you so much for that. So next we have, I think it's on the screen already, Sarah. Uh, so I have a question for you, which is, um, can you elaborate like the ability to uh, vote on much, like how the ability to vote on much serves uh, as a form of constitutive uh, rhetoric. Sorry, everything went. <laughs> um, well, I, I guess I, I, I guess when I think of uh, constitutive rhetoric, I think of, you know, in, in this case, like what is calling people um, into being? Like why are certain people like gravitating towards the language? Like what, what is inciting them to join, <laughs> to become a digital vigilante? I guess you could think of. Um, and and I, I think that they recognize people recognize themselves in the discourse and the language and the symbols of thinking like you know what this is this is something I want to engage in you know it, I guess I'm just thinking back at like when it's entertainment you know the people aren't necessarily engaging as to to be um, vigilantes they're hearing this call of uh, maybe participating in something I want to vote for these people but somehow they're also still engaging in it so they're they're seeing themselves and it they be kind of call into, I guess, certain actions and, and words call into being a certain group of people to do certain um, acts. And I, I guess I'm just interested in how, like the rhetoric that calls people into being and, and what what it is that makes someone join instead of just passively sitting by. So I think that's one thing that my chapter left me, like, why are we joining and how, how are groups calling into being, or words and, and action, or, words and, and posts and, and social media calling into being a group of people that may not have been together um, before um, to, to do certain things, so. Thank you so much. Uh, so I don't know if anyone has a question. I think we have hold you for a bit now, uh, but just wanted to let you know, if you do, please share it with, um, with us in the chat feature. But if not, uh, I would like to thank everyone for like being here. I know we all have like different schedules and we're like everywhere around the world. So thank you for taking time to actually, yeah, sit down with uh, with me and with like basically the OBP team, not present, but present in, in, in the spirit. Mm -hmm.